Hey y'all, I'm Sarah. And I'm Casey. And we are Relatively Relatively Dark. Dark. I don't know how to start. I don't know how to start. I've only done one. It's our first episode. It is. I'm excited. I'm just going to jump in. Okay. In 1961, Betty Gail Brown was a 19-year-old sophomore at Transylvania College in Lexington, Kentucky. Close to home. Very close to home. She lived off campus with her parents just three miles away in a middle-class neighborhood on Lackawanna Road. Say that one more time. Lackawanna. Okay. (laughs) Um, She was the only child of Hargis and Quincy Brown. He was an insurance salesman, and she worked part-time as an interior decorator. She... She... (laughs) (laughs) And so it begins. Yes. She had a good relationship with both of her parents. She went to... Is it Lafayette? I think I say Lafayette. She went to that high school. She was near the top of her, if you hear jingling, it's my dog, sorry. She was near the top of her class, and she was a member of the National Honor Society. She was active in extracurricular activities. She had lots of friends, belonged to one of the most active sororities on campus. Sorry. (laughs) And she was also very active in her church. She taught Sunday school, and she sang in the choir. Hmm. People in her neighborhood said she was a sweet and friendly girl. And friends described her as likable, friendly, and positive. A person who was accommodating to her friends and very mature for her age. And how old again was she? She was 19. Um, She had several boyfriends throughout high school and college. And one of her exes, I guess you could say, he said that she had strict moral standards. And she wanted to keep herself clean and pure until she was married. Which is good. She's a good girl. Um, Around the time of the event that we're going to get into... She appeared to be dating a football player who was a student at the University of Kentucky. Okay. According to Quincy, her mom, she didn't have a steady boyfriend, though. So now we're going to talk about the day of October 26th in 1961. The day starts off like any other day. She has breakfast at home with her parents. She left for campus for a normal day of classes, and she was going to study for a biology exam the next day. She usually drove her car, which is a 1959 Simca. I'd never heard of a Simca. Mm -mm. It was a cute little car, though. (laughs) But the heater was messed up, so her dad took it to the shop. So she took her dad's car. Okay. On her way to school, she dropped her mom off at work, and then the rest of the day was normal. Classes, studying for that exam the next day, and then she gets home at the end of the day. She has a home-cooked meal with her parents. She told them that she was going to go to campus to study more with friends for that exam, and she said she'd be home between 10 and 11 that night. And she also told her parents about a movie that was playing at the drive-in that she thought they would like. She was like, you know, y'all should go to the movie. Uh, After supper, she helped her mom clear the table and wash the dishes. Mm -hmm. And they leave a little before 7 to go to the movie, and Betty Gale left just a few minutes after them. And she drove her car this time. She gets to the campus around 7.15. So this just shows how close she lives. Because if she left a few minutes after 7, and she gets there by 7.15. She parked in a semi-circle driveway across from 4 Hall, where she was going to meet up with her friends to study. She meets up with three friends. She said she planned on staying for three hours. She studies till about 10.15, takes a break. And during this break, she asks the house mother if she can get permission to stay later. Because she's still not done studying. My goodness. Like, I couldn't do it. I did not have that discipline. No, I mean, I study, but not like that. <laughs> no, mine was the morning of the test. I was on the bus trying to study because I did not do it before then. We're a bit different. <laughs> we are just a tad. <laughs> no, I'm not that. I was never that um, dedicated, though. <laughs> In between me and her. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, the house mother gives her permission to stay until midnight. Around 11.55, she says goodbye to her friends, thanks the house mother for letting her stay, and she leaves through the front door, gets in her car to leave campus. Well, Quincy and Hargis, they get home about 10.30 that night, and Quincy was actually relieved she always liked being home before she got there, like she wanted to be there when she got home. Hargis goes to bed because he has a headache, and she wanted to wait up for Betty Gale, so she puts on her PJs, 
she grabs the newspaper and a magazine and she crawls into betty gale's bed with a heating pad so the bed would be warm for her when she got home oh my goodness um what a mother yeah she was awesome she finishes the paper finishes the magazine and it's about midnight and she's like well betty gale said she was gonna be home by 11 and she said that she knew the dorm closed at 12 so then she figured you know well it's 12 now so she'll be home you know any minute and she thought about waking up her husband, but she knew he'd tell her not to worry, you know, plus he had a headache, so she decided to wait a little longer. At 12.40, so this is over an hour and a half later than Betty Gale said she'd be home, 40 minutes after the dorm had closed, she decides to go look for her. So she throws on her coat over her pajamas, and she heads toward campus. She takes the same route that she assumed Betty would have taken, and she drove slow, looking up and down for her car, so she gets to Four Hall, and it looked closed. So she checks the parking lots around the dorm, and she never sees Betty's car. On the drive... Drive? <laughs> That's not a word. <laughs> That's not even a word. So she drives back home, and she takes the same route, still looking. And she later said, The closer I got to home, the more relieved I was because I felt that I had just missed her on the way and that she'd be there when I got there. I expected her car to be in the garage, but when I pulled up, that's when my heart sank because the garage was empty. Mm. So she gets back in the car, and she goes to the campus again, taking a different route. She gets there. She drives slow, looks up and down, looks up and down the street mm -hmm. <laughs> until she got about halfway home. And then she gets about halfway home, and then she books it the rest of the way home because she's starting to get worried. Yeah. <clears throat> um, around 1.45, she gets home from the second trip, and the garage is still empty. So now she wakes up Hargis. Yeah. He again, he tells her not to worry. He says she maybe got something to eat, took someone home, but she was like, no, something's wrong. A mother knows. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he gets up, he calls the city and the county police departments, and he asks if there's been any accidents reported involving a gray 59 Simca. There were none. Quincy then calls all the hospitals. Nothing. Around 2 a.m., she called for Hall and talked to the house mother, and she told her, you know, I told her she could stay late. She left about midnight, and nobody left with her. Um, sometime after 2.30, Hargis called the police department, and then, then he reports her missing. Mm -hmm. And they immediately issue an all-points bulletin for Betty Gale and her car. So he calls. Real oh, quick. go ahead. This was two hours, right, or two and a half hours after she was last seen. Yeah, she was last seen, like, right at midnight. Okay, just curious. Two and a half but, hours later, that's good. Yeah. Um, well, her dad, Hargis, he calls, like, the local restaurants and stuff that he knows that she goes to all the time. He calls the football, the football lodge. Oh, okay, I didn't even know what word you were trying to say. <laughs> at UK, because, you know, that guy that she had recently been seeing, he didn't get an answer. So all this, it gives him nothing. Right. So then he goes to look for her. He goes to the lodge, all these different restaurants, and then he gets home about three, and Quincy's like, okay, it's my turn again. So she goes out for her third time and Man. the fourth time all together, and she told him, she was like, you know, I'm not coming back until I find our daughter. So the detective that got the call for the All Points Bulletin, he goes straight to Transylvania campus. He goes to Forer Hall. He doesn't get any leads that way. Like, they don't know any more than what he already knows. Yeah. So he starts searching the campus grounds. In a semicircle driveway across from Morrison Hall, which is another dorm on campus, isn't the same driveway she parked in earlier. Right. It was four hall, <clears throat> right? Yeah. Four. It's hard to say. F-O-R-R-E-R. -R -E oh, okay. <laughs> I thought you were saying four. Four. Whatever. <laughs> <laughs> He looks in this driveway, and he sees a car that matches the description of Betty's. So he stops, gets out of the car, walks up to it, and he finds Betty Gail Brown mm -hmm. sitting in the driver's seat with her head slumped back, her eyes closed, and a bra hanging around her neck. So mm -hmm. he, he knew from the get-go that she was gone. Yeah. He made no attempt to open the car or examine the body, left the doors locked, you know, secured the crime scene, and called it in. Like you're supposed to do. Right. Within minutes, police were there on the scene, along with Captain Gilbert Cravens and Captain Brian Henry, which were detectives, and the city's coroner, Chester Hager. Okay. Um, Duckworth relayed that he secured the crime scene and all that, 
And at the time all this is happening, just after 3 a.m., this is the same time that Quincy is leaving to go search for her. Mm. While she's searching, she sees a police officer combing over a driveway with a spotlight. And she's like, oh, well, he must be looking for Betty. So she runs up to him, tells him who she is, and she's like, have you found my daughter? So the police officer tells her the terrible news. Yeah. And he takes Quincy home. When they get to the Brown home, Hargis opens the door before they can get up to it. And he says, what's wrong? What's happened? And Quincy just says, Betty Gill is dead. Um, Betty Gill's funeral was held on October 30th, 1961 at Lexington's Central Christian Church, where she was a member. And the minister, who knew Betty so well from all of her work at the church, described her as a very special and precious young woman whose sudden loss was punishing to all who had known her. Mm. She was laid to rest at the Bluegrass Memorial Garden Cemetery. All right, so now I'm going to go over the crime scene. Okay. Uh, Detective Cravens and Henry obviously knew she had been murdered. She had a cut on her forehead. Her bra was resting on her shoulders around her neck, and she had significant bruises and abrasions on her neck. Um, there was blood on her forehead from a cut, and on the dash near the passenger side, there was blood. Okay. So they think her head was hit on the dashboard. Um, to the driver's side? I don't think it was like all the way on the passenger side. Okay. It was just more on that side than the driver's side. The front driver's side door and both of the back doors were locked, but the front passenger side door wasn't. So all but the front passenger side door were locked. Okay. They later learned that there may have been an issue with that lock, so that may have been why it was the only one that wasn't locked, but mm -hmm. I never saw anything that confirmed that so i don't know okay the bra both of its straps were torn the clasp was broken and there was a four inch piece that was ripped off and laying in her lap so this made them think that it was probably forcibly removed mm -hmm. and so they're initially thinking you know rape or some other kind of sexual assault was the motive but aside from the bra the rest of her clothes were perfectly fine okay she was wearing Bermuda shorts, a blouse, a wool sweater, and a raincoat. Her shorts were buttoned, zipped, and in the right place, weren't pulled down or anything. Mm -hmm. um, and her shirt was still tucked into her shorts. Her shirt was fully buttoned other than the top two buttons. Okay. Which she probably just didn't button those. Yeah. I mean, I don't like having my shirt buttoned all the way up either. Nope. Um, so all of this makes them think the motive wasn't of a sexual nature. Right. Like, there would have been more evidence of that. In the front seat of the car, they found her notebooks and stuff, her study materials. They found her car keys in the floorboard behind the driver's seat. And somewhere in the car, they found her purse and her money, her credit cards, lipstick, cigarettes, whatever. All of that was in her purse. So now, they can pretty much roll out robbery Yeah. as motive. So it's not sexual, and it's not robbery. So they searched the outside of the car and the surrounding area, and they didn't find anything that seemed relevant to the crime scene. They did find a woman's gold watch, but they didn't think it was related in any way because Betty Gale was still wearing her watch. Okay. So they thought, you know, it was just happened to be there. Somebody lost it there, whatever. Okay. Um, Coroner Hager wasn't a physician, so he couldn't perform the autopsy. But he did request for blood samples and hair samples to okay. be collected. He's like, make sure you get those. <laughs> The autopsy was performed by a Lexington Clinic physician, and Hager, the coroner, three additional physicians, and a detective were present at the autopsy. Uh, he released a written statement or a written report of his findings five days after her murder on November 1st, which was Granny's birthday. <laughs> yes. Uh, he noted the cut on her forehead, along with some superficial swelling, small abrasions on her abdomen, her back her arms, her legs, and her face, and there was a significant injury around her left eye, probably from being hit on the dash. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, most of the injuries were in the neck area, and he found significant hemorrhaging in the larynx and esophagus and bone fractures in the neck. Mm -hmm. uh, the contents of her stomach showed a substantial amount of food, but nothing could be identified because it had already been digested. Yeah. So I guess... If they had thought maybe she had went to a restaurant or whatever, they would know because that wouldn't be digested yet. Hmm. So, I don't know. 
and he said there was no evidence of any sexual activity whatsoever on that day of her death. Um, he estimated the time of death to be 1.15 a.m. His final sentence of the report stated that cause of death would appear to be suffocation from strangulation by external force applied in such a manner as to produce abrasions around the neck with crushing and hemorrhage into the larynx. Okay. That was one long sentence. Yeah. Um, which they pretty much already knew that that was most likely her cause of death. Uh, the coroner, Hager, he took a look at her clothes and he found lipstick smudges on her shorts and several specimens of human hair on her sweater. So he turns over all of the clothing, the hair samples, her personal belongings to the police. Captain Henry and his team, they examine every inch of the car's interior. And he found blood in three places, drops on the rear floorboard, small smears on the driver's side window and a larger amount on the passenger side of the dashboard. He sent all these blood samples to get tested and all the results showed that all the samples were type O, which is the same as Betty Gilbert. Okay. Which back in the 60s, that's pretty much all they could do with right. blood anyways. I think it was the mid 80s, late 80s or something when they could actually get like DNA from it. Hmm. I could be wrong, but I think that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Captain Henry, he found three clear fingerprints, you know, plus tons of smudges, but three he could, you know, be sent off for identification. So he's hoping that at least one of these belongs to the killer. So now they're looking for witnesses. They interview three students who studied with Belly. With Belly? Belly studied with Betty <laughs> and learned that she was there at Four Hall for close to five hours, left around midnight with the impression that she was going home. Uh, witnesses stated that she was popular on campus, a devoted student who was active in extracurricular activities, and a very thoughtful and intelligent girl. And no one could think of anyone on or off campus that would want to hurt her, or didn't like her for that matter. Right. Basically, they didn't find anything that would help them. After interviewing more than 100 witnesses, they learned two things that they found interesting. Okay. They said Betty Gale was extremely cautious about locking her doors and wouldn't have opened them to a stranger. Okay. So this leads them to believe that she may have known her killer. Mm -hmm. The second thing they found out from Betty Gale's best friend was that she would often take her bra off when she was on her period. And hmm. from the autopsy, they found out that she was on her period at the time she died. So, this gave them a little bit of doubt that the bra was forcibly removed. Okay. Even though it was damaged. But it's weird to me because even if, you know, sometimes they get tender during that time or whatever, mm -hmm. and even if she did have a habit of taking it off, if she was like 10 minutes away from home, why would she take, why wouldn't she just I don't know. wait? It's just weird to me. Yeah. And some people had brought up, you know, that her clothes were fine. Her shirt was still tucked into her shorts and this and that. How'd you take her? And I'm like, you could have fixed your clothes. Yeah. And all of us girls know that you can unclip it and pull it right out the sleeve. Yes. You don't even have to do anything with your shirt. So Sometimes that's irrelevant. Top. Yes. <laughs> um, one witness was a student named Charles Risden. He was 19, same age as Betty. And he told the police that he had seen Betty after she left the dorm, spoke with her for a few minutes, and drove home. And he lived in another dorm on campus, and he said he saw Betty drive past him after he parked at his dorm, and this was about 12.05. <clears throat> okay. He said he was pretty sure that she had stopped at a red light. He goes inside his dorm, listen to record, talk with a friend, tidied up a bit or whatever, and he's in bed about 1.45 in the morning. Uh, Captain Cravens obtained evidence that pretty strongly validated his alibi. However, about a week later, he did ask Risden to take a polygraph test, and he did willingly agree. Mm -hmm. They asked him questions. Did you strangle Betty? Do you know who did? You know, all that stuff. And he did pass, and there was nothing showing that he was being deceptive. Okay. So they pretty much ruled him out as a suspect. So they know she left right about midnight and was headed home. But they don't know where she went when she left campus. They don't know if she was with anyone, why she went back, none of that. Within hours of the body being found, newspapers 
had already released front page headlines about the murder. One said, transy co-ed found strangled. One said, transy co-ed is slain, police seeking clues and killer. What do you mean? Oh, Transylvania. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry, I didn't even think No, about I it. didn't. I wouldn't have either. Transy co-ed, Transylvania. Also, the same day Betty Gill was found, uh, one newspaper printed a front page story with pictures of the crime scene. And another paper printed additional front page coverage with a picture of her body as it was found, dead in the car. Oh, my god! Front gosh. page of the newspaper. I think that's uh, wrong on a lot of levels. Yeah. So, from the newspaper, the public knew that she was strangled with her own bra. They knew the condition in which her body was found, including all of her injuries. They knew that all the doors were locked except the front passenger side door. They knew the keys were found in the black for the back foreboard. Mm-hmm. Just move past it. You know what I'm trying <laughs> to say. And and they knew that the authorities didn't think rape or robbery was the motive. They had no leads, suspects. They even mentioned in the papers about Charles Risden as being the last person to have seen her. They knew the clothes she was wearing, the fact that they were undisturbed. I mean, pretty much everything that the police knew, the public knew. That's. I don't think that that's right. I think yeah. only the parents should know. Yeah, that, and as you probably know, I'm sure, usually they're slow to release stuff like that because, you know, it helps them filter out false confessions. Right, because if they don't know details about the crime scene, then they're not going to be there. Or if there's someone they come across and they mention something that was just available to the police, then they're going to know that they knew about it. Exactly. Yeah, so pretty much they either had someone involved in the investigation leaking this information or they just told the police everything not the police. They just told the public everything because they had nothing to go on. So they're like, this is all the information. If anybody has anything, but still keep something. Yeah. But I mean, I'm not in law enforcement, so what do I know? I don't agree with it. Yeah. <laughs> but the crime scene photos had to have come from someone within the police department because the crime scene was under the supervision of Captain Cravens and Captain Henry. So, like, the people from the media didn't just walk up there while they were investigating No, exactly. It was pictures. all sealed off and everything like that. So, how did the media get yeah. the pictures? They did get an early lead, though. Two days after the body was found, a waitress at a restaurant, she claimed to have seen Betty Gale in that restaurant the night slash morning, whatever, of the killing between midnight and 1 a.m. She said Betty came into the restaurant about 12.15 with another woman, ordered hot chocolate, and tea. They sat and talked for a little bit. Betty paid the bill and then they left the restaurant together. Okay. She described the woman, because obviously the police are going to be like, okay, well, we need to talk to her. Right. Uh, she described the woman that was with her as around 21 or 22 years old, a good complexion, normal accent, and looked to be about 115 pounds. The waitress also described what the girl she thought to be Betty was wearing, which was right. But it had already been plastered all over the newspapers. Right. So, you know, what's the point? Um, investigators showed her the clothes that Betty Gill was wearing when she was murdered, and she recognized them. They took her to the funeral home to show her the body, and she positively identified the victim as one of the women she saw in the restaurant. Okay. Which just seems weird to me. That yeah, they're just but like, I guess right now they don't have anything else to go on. Yeah, I guess, but do they not have a picture of her? True. Yeah, that... <laughs> like you have to show her the deceased body of this victim that was brutally murdered mm -mm. like i don't know it just seems messed up to me i feel like maybe they're just grass minstrels yeah this was in the 60s though so true i don't know they did more they uh took her to campus to see if she could identify the other woman showed her pictures of female students and everything but she never could identify any of them but what's weird is two male students who were actually friends with Betty Gill, were at the same restaurant the night of the murder from 11.30 to 1.30 in the morning, okay. and they said they never saw her. So it's odd to me that, you know, she had said that she had never seen Betty Gill before, but she remembers what she's wearing, remembers this, can pick her out, and this and that, and then two of her friends, they would notice her right. if she was in there. So maybe that girl's not think. telling the truth. Well... An employee at a different restaurant claimed to have seen Betty there at 1 a.m. the same night and said she had left with a man. Okay. 
So they did the same thing for this employee, took him to the funeral home to see the body, and he identified her as the one at the restaurant, but couldn't give him any information about the guy that she supposedly left with. Okay. Um, ultimately, all this turned into a dead end. Shocking. <laughs> I mean, they really didn't have any sufficient evidence to corroborate either yeah. story. But that didn't stop the newspapers from publishing details about these witness accounts and eventually reporting straight up lies. They reported that um, the police were going to question the woman that was with Betty the night that she was killed. My goodness. Not true. She was never identified. And they even claimed that a woman had confessed to the murder and had been arrested. My goodness. What is wrong with people? These newspaper editors, Mm -hmm. columnists, reporters, whatever you want to call them, are uh, doofuses. (laughs) The... um, Yeah, you dingus. <laughs> uh, police authorities denied all those reports, but the chief of police allegedly announced that investigators hadn't ruled out the possibility that the killer might have been a woman. And he said, This possibility has been gaining prominence hourly with the obvious reluctance of a mysterious woman companion of Miss Brown to identify herself and cooperate with the police. If there was a mysterious woman, she never came forward. Okay. Nothing really came of it. Um... There were a lot of other tips, uh, one from a newspaper delivery driver who supposedly saw a young man get into Betty Gale's car around one in the morning two weeks before the murder, and one from someone who lived in another dorm on campus. Uh, she said she heard a woman screaming around one thirty, and then heard her car driving off and then nothing. Okay. But nothing led them any closer to finding the killer. I mean, there was no evidence. Yeah. You know, they would find something that contradicted the tips, you know. Etc. Etc. So, remember, I mentioned earlier that they had those three fingerprints. Right. Well, they could only be visually identified. So, like, people had almost like index cards. Yeah. Of fingerprints. They didn't have the, uh, what is it? The database thing to look through. But yeah, so they just had to look side by side these fingerprints and, like, these yeah. lines match, these lines match. That would suck. Yeah, I don't want that job. Um, they concluded that One belonged to Quincy Brown, the mother, and one belonged to Hargis Brown, the father. So they're left with one unidentified fingerprint. They fingerprinted about half of the male students at the college, which is about 250 people. Mm. No match. As it turned out, the third fingerprint actually belonged to the mechanic that had worked on her heater the morning of her murder. Okay. So that didn't help them with anything. So now, since the fingerprint was really their only lead, they have to start looking into the other tips and leads that, you know... Come in that you don't even know if they're real or not. Yeah, didn't seem near as promising. And they had received hundreds. So they invested... Invested? They investigated (laughs) any lead that couldn't be ruled out, like, from the get-go. So I'm going to try and briefly (laughs) go over (laughs) a couple that were outlined in the book that I read. So, on two separate occasions, two different women told police that they were attacked on campus by a man claiming to be involved in Betty Gale's murder. They dismissed one as irrelevant because the description was too broad to be narrowed down. Like, they they couldn't find him because it was just, like, a man that was average height, average looks, average hair. You know what I mean? And they decided that there was nothing to connect the other attack to Betty Gale's murder. Okay. One was four nights... After the murder, and the other was two weeks, within two weeks of the murder. Uh, Another lead they followed up on was uh, there was a male student who knew Betty and had often studied with her, but he abruptly dropped out and moved to Michigan after the murder. Uh, When he was questioned, he told police that everyone expected too much of him, his parents, his classmates, his church, and he was gay, so that was part of, you know, the pressures and stuff, and this is in the 60s. Yeah. So, uh, more accepted nowadays, obviously. Yeah. Um, investigators showed him explicit crime scene photos, and they said they got no emotional reaction. Okay. Uh, he told him he had nothing to do with it, and he offered to go back to Lexington to take a lie detector test. And in the book, it said Captain Cravens left Michigan without a shred of doubt about the credibility of the student. Okay. So, I'm like... Did he take the lie detector test? I guess not. I'm sure there was maybe more background that, you know, excluded him. 
There was also a 41-year-old man that worked in the school's cafeteria who had moved to Atlanta, Georgia, right after Betty's funeral. Uh, He lived in an apartment near campus, uh, but his wife and children were living in Atlanta at the time of the murder. Okay. Uh, Investigators learned that he had previously been convicted of drunk driving, use of a firearm without a permit, and a dispute with a neighbor. Pretty minor stuff compared to murder. Mm -hmm. Um, But the police went to Atlanta to question him, and he told him that he left because he was tired of working 12 to 14 hour days. He gave a supervisor a letter of resignation before he moved to be with his family. And Captain Craven submitted a report that said, quote, After studying this subject, his activities, his reaction response to viewing the pictures, and various related questions, his readiness to submit to a lie detector test, we cannot feel that this subject should be a suspect in this case. Okay. On to the next. One of the most interesting, I guess you could say, allegations, um, a lot of students the police interviewed suggested that Quincy Brown, Betty Gale's own mother, may have been involved in her murder. Okay. But after talking to Quincy, uh, giving her a lie detector test, getting her statement, they were pretty much like, this woman didn't kill her kid. Yeah. There was one really strange student suspect. About 5 o'clock in the morning on October of 1962, so almost a full year after the murder, in a park in New York City, a woman was arrested for carrying a concealed loaded weapon after pulling a revolver on two police officers. Okay. Uh, After her arrest, authorities discovered that underneath the woman's silk stockings, gray skirt, high heels, girdle, and fake breasts was actually a man. Oh. (laughs) Was not expecting that. Um, While searching his belongings, they found newspaper clippings about the murder and a letter from the person who sent him the newspaper clippings outlining the details of the ongoing investigation. And these clippings were dated almost a year earlier. So he had been carrying these around since the murder, like 11 Uh, months. Yeah, that's weird. The guy told police that he had been a student at Transylvania College and a friend had sent him the newspaper clippings. And he said he didn't know Betty Gale Brown and he knew nothing about her murder. Uh, When they asked him why he was dressed as a woman, again, this is the 60s. He said he had disguised himself as a woman to try and catch some thieves that had broken into his car three different times. Okay. And he also said that he did crazy things when he drank, which he did, apparently, right before. (laughs) Okay. Um, That was his explanation. Uh, Investigators looked into this guy and his friend that sent him the newspaper and basically concluded there wasn't any evidence connecting either one of them to the murder. Okay. After all these tips, all these leads, all these suspects, the case pretty much went cold. Mm -hmm. They were still investigating, of course, but they really didn't have anything to go on. Until January of 1965, police in Klamath Falls, Oregon, are told that an inmate wants to speak with a detective, and he wants to get something off his chest. Uh, A detective by the name of Dennis W. Lilly goes to speak with this man, and he tells Detective Lilly, I think I killed a woman back in Kentucky. And he's like, you think you Mm -hmm. killed her? And the inmate said, sometimes I feel like I'm just dreaming about it. But I'm 99% sure I killed her. Creepy. Yeah. I have it in my notes. Who is this man? (laughs) This man is Alex Arnold Jr. He was 33 years old at the time, born in Lexington. He lived there for most of his life, apart from two years when he served in the military during the Korean War and one year when he was incarcerated. When he was released from prison, he traveled across the country, stopping, you know, briefly here and there along the way, and he eventually ended up in Oregon. Okay. Where did you say he was from? Lexington. Oh. And how old is he? 33. And how many years has it been since the murder? (laughs) Uh, He was arrested in 1965. Three years after the murder. Almost. He was arrested? Yes. Okay. Okay, sorry. I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay. On January 16th of 1965, he was arrested for disorderly conduct and convicted for public intoxication. The judge issued him a $25 fine plus court costs, but he had made this cross-country trip somehow with no job, no car, and no money. 
So he couldn't pay the $25 fine, so he was sentenced to 10 days in jail. Okay. The first few days of his sentence went without incident. He got along with other inmates. He ate good, participated in the normal activities. But after a few days without alcohol, Mm -hmm. however, he started having withdrawals. He had trouble sleeping. He wasn't eating. He had the shakes. He thought there was a mind-reading machine outside of his cell. Okay. He heard voices and music, and he talked to his toilet paper and the door hinges. But it turns out that he was suffering from delirium tremens, which I didn't know that with alcohol withdrawals could get that bad. Like, I knew drugs yeah, could get really bad. Yeah, I don't really know bad, if I knew that about alcohol either. You learn something new every day. Uh... <laughs> At one point, he threatened to kill himself, so he was put on suicide watch, and he was taken somewhere where they could keep a closer eye on him, and he would later say that the mind-reading machine had followed him to where they took him, which is actually sad. Yeah. So, now let's talk about what else he told this Detective Lily. He said that he found her parked in the middle of the night on campus, He said she was partially undressed, and she was, quote-unquote, making love to another woman. What? Yeah. He claimed they got into a fight after he he had asked her for a match for a cigarette, and he hit her head on the dashboard, and then he got in the car, and he used her bra to choke her. He claimed that after he hit her head on the dash, he was afraid she'd identify him to the police. I thought I had a frog again. Oh, is that like where you like breathe in real deep and it's like, mm. yeah. <coughs> I've never heard that. A frog in your throat? You've never heard a frog in my throat? Uh, maybe. I don't remember. <laughs> you learned two things today. So, Detective Lily called the county health official of Klamath Falls and he asked him to do a complete physical and mental exam of Arnold. He tells Detective Lily that he had already examined him when he first got to the jail and he found him to be in good health both physically and mentally. So he's like, there's no point. So then Detective Lilly, he called the Lexington authorities. And the chief of police in Lexington, he assigns three people to figure out if this Arnold dude is telling the truth. He assigned Captain Gilbert Cravens, Captain Brian Henry, and Lieutenant Morris Carter. They find out pretty quick that Arnold was in Lexington when the murder occurred. He had a criminal record and that he lived a block and a half away from the Transylvania campus back then. Okay. They also thought that he knew information that hadn't been reported in the media. So Captain Henry and Lieutenant Carter go to Klamath Falls to talk to Arnold, and they start by telling him the usual, you don't have to talk to us, you can have a lawyer present, blah, blah, blah. And Arnold says he'll talk to him without a lawyer. Okay. So Arnold tells them that this is what happened. He said he was drunk that night, looking for somewhere to sleep it off, and he wound up finding a place on campus. And he thought this was between 11 p.m. and 12 a.m., midnight. He said he How slept... How does he remember all this? I'm trying to be more involved. <laughs> You're too involved. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just keep that in mind. Okay. Um, he said he slept for about an hour. He, When he woke up, he had some wine left, so he finished that off, and he decided to leave the campus and go back downtown to the bars. He said on his way off campus, he saw two women sitting in a car, and they were hugging and kissing. Okay. And he stops to ask them for a match, for a cigarette. He said the two women got mad, and they start cussing at him. So then he gets mad, and he jerks the driver's side door open, and he slammed Betty Gill's head against the dash, and then realized that it knocked her out. He told him that at some point during all of this, the other woman had jumped out of the car and ran away. So he's freaking out that he'll be identified, and he sees her bra laying on the back of the front seat, so he gets in and he uses the bra to strangle her. And he tells them he then left campus and he went to a friend's house, and he tells that friend that he had just killed a woman. The detectives interview Arnold again later, and at the end of their third interview, he signs a written confession. Okay. So the confession that he signed said that he held the bra tight around her neck for about a minute and a half, threw the bra in the front seat, wiped his prints off the dash, locked all the doors except for the passenger door, 
and went to his friend's house. You remember all of That's the doors were locked except ask. the one yeah. that was unlocked. I was going to ask about that because I was thinking that why would anybody think to lock any doors? So, but if he said he did, then... See, and it makes sense that the passenger door would be unlocked if that girl ran out. But anyways. Why would he intentionally... I knew it. There it went. Frogs out. <laughs> well, <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> why would he intentionally leave that door unlocked if he's going to say, I locked all of them except that one? I don't we'll get to that too. Keep yeah, that this is weird. So I have another thought about this. I have always been under the impression, I've heard before, I've read before, that it takes a decent amount of time to strangle somebody. He says that he did it in about a minute and a half. But what I've heard and read, whatever, it's like four or five minutes. Like it takes a decent amount of time to strangle somebody until they're dead. I didn't think anything about it because all I've seen is like movies and TV shows. Well, so (laughs) the longer we do this, the more you'll have thoughts like that trust me apparently um the end of this confession said quote i have been asked by lieutenant lieutenant it sounded like you said lieutenant <laughs> lieutenant <laughs> i have been asked by lieutenant carter and captain henry if i wish to add or take anything from this statement and i do not i have not been threatened nor has anyone made any promises to me before during or after the taking of this statement I have been treated with nothing but kindness and respect by both the Klamath Falls Police and the Lexington Police. Uh, A warrant was issued for Alex Arnold Jr.'s arrest by Judge Richard P. Maloney, and the judge appointed Amos Eblen to represent Arnold. And Eblen was actually a judge himself, but Judge Maloney knew that he was the best person to represent Arnold. Uh, Also, part of Arnold's defense team was a lawyer named Robert G. Lawson, which is actually, actually, <laughs> actually the author of the book that I read about this case. Oh, cool. And I will tell you the name of that later. Um, so Arnold's taken to jail to await his trial. So his defense team, their first interview with him was January 25th of 1965. Okay. So this is nine days after he was first arrested. Okay. At this point, they didn't have a copy of Arnold's confession yet. But, because of the newspapers, these flinging, flinging newspapers, they already knew what he had told detectives. They didn't really talk about much during that first interview. Arnold wasn't very talkative, but they did ask him about the whole, you know, 99% sure thing. They said, you know, it sounds like you might not be absolutely sure that you killed her. To which Arnold said, I killed her. So, now they want to find out more about this guy, his background and stuff. They find out that he was born in Lexington in 1931. He didn't have a good relationship with his family, and he had pretty much cut ties with everyone. Uh, He had a better relationship with his mom than his dad, but he still refused to see her when she went to visit him in jail. So, still not a very good relationship. I feel like I need to let a yawn out. It's okay. It's like every now and then it's just like it comes up oh, and I'm, I'm like this. I just realized I did not change the size of the font on the rest of this because it's huge. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, look. Oh, gosh. <laughs> um, they learned that he dropped out of school before he entered high school. And he started working on horse farms. And he was actually, uh, he actually got public recognition for his grooming and his training of horses. <laughs> he did all this until his early 20s. And he got married and had a kid. And after this is when he... Spent those two years in the Marines. While he was serving, part of his unit actually got stuck behind enemy lines, which was obviously, you know, traumatic experience. Yeah. And he received three medals of honor for his service. But once he left the military, this is when he started drinking. Yeah, I was wondering what it was that turned his life the wrong way. Yeah, which really sad, but I mean, that's the case a lot of times with, you know, traumatic experiences and being in wars and stuff. And it wasn't long after this that he was officially labeled a drunk in the town. Um, At some point, his wife filed assault charges against him, and she didn't end up dropping the charges, but she soon filed for divorce. And this was sometime in the mid-50s. Okay. And it's not clear. It didn't say in the book what specifically he did. Yeah. But I'm assuming it wasn't anything too serious. Um, But I don't know. 
In April of 1962, which is about six months before Betty Gill's murder, police uncovered a prostitution ring that Arnold was involved in. Okay. He provided customers for the sex workers. Uh, He was convicted and sentenced to a year in the Kentucky State Reformatory. He got out, he moved back to Lexington, and he was in the same situation as before. No job, no house, no friends really. Um, After a few months in Lexington, this is when he started wandering, you know, all around the country and ended up in Klamath Falls, Oregon. Okay. So Judge Eblin, he starts going over all the information that's been published in the papers, you know, seeing how many details from the confession had already been reported. Yeah. And he concluded that the newspapers had covered nearly everything that Arnold had told them during their first interview. Yeah. Okay, so now they have the confession after they had already did their initial interview with Arnold. This is when they discover that the confession was written by Detective Carter. What? Not by Arnold. So did he just write everything and Arnold signed it? Someone who's delusional and says that they need... They, golly. Okay, so... Trust me, just hang on. Who is the one who asked the physician to assess him? Uh, that was Detective Lily. From? Klamath Falls. Okay. Carter... Is from Lexington? Yes. Well, I guess I was thinking that the Lexington guys would make sure that this is right because... But at the same time, I guess it would make sense if they're not the ones to make sure it's right because they want it closed. It's been three years. So they ask around about the detectives that took Arnold's confession. The defense lawyers ask around because they're like, are they shady or what? Yeah. But everyone said that they were good officers. They were totally trustworthy. Okay. So when they look over the confession... They feel the detectives really hammered in the fact that Arnold was treated fairly. But what really troubled them was the fact that, given his mental state at the time, how would he fully understand his rights? How would he understand that he's entitled to a lawyer, but he doesn't want one? You know what I mean? How would he understand that he's signing a confession of murder if he's talking to his toilet paper and he's hearing music out of nowhere and he thinks there's a mind-reading machine? But all the stuff that he said was already said. Was already said. Exactly. He made a point to put in that confession that he left that passenger door unlocked. But you know what wasn't in the confession? What? The statement that he said he was 99% sure. Not to mention the fact that Arnold didn't write it himself. So they're thinking that important details could have been left out to fit the detective's narrative of what Mm -hmm. happened. Also in the confession, confession, Arnold... Confessioned? Is that what I said? Mm Mm-hmm. Well, it's me. Also, in the confession, Arnold, quote, unquote, he stated four times that he was drunk. On one occasion, he used the phrase crazy drunk. So how would someone that inebriated remember remember so many details three years later and think to wipe his fingerprints off of the dash? According to the papers, authorities attributed some of their suspicion of Arnold to the fact that his story tied closely with facts of the crime, and he had details that weren't published. So, let's go over a few things in Arnold's confession that were established by the investigators that they knew were facts. What investigators? In Lexington. The Lexington investigators. Like, the beginning of the crime. Yeah. They knew she was strangled with her own bra, which he said... They knew her head was smashed on the dashboard because of the blood. They knew that she was left in the driver's seat with her head leaning back, Mm -hmm. which is exactly how she was found and exactly what he said. Mm -hmm. But all of this was in the papers. Right. Okay. (laughs) That's what I was saying. So, like... Yeah. That's what I was saying. Like, what information did he put in his confession that wasn't already in the media when it happened? Did they say what those details were? Trust me, we'll go over all this. I need to know now. Some of the stuff in the confession that didn't add up with what Arnold said. Arnold said that... (laughs) My bad. (laughs) It's okay. He said that he threw the bra in the front seat. Okay. Not true. It was found around her neck. Oh, yeah. Dang it, I wish I would have cut that. (laughs) He said that she was with another woman, 
But he could have said that because of the newspaper stories about the waitress yep, that was, saw her with another woman. I was thinking that. But. Thinking that it tied together, but. Yeah. But the thing is, do you think this other woman could have left in such a hurry without leaving anything behind? Because there was no evidence whatsoever. Yeah. Of another woman being in the car. I mean, Arnold said that she jumped out of the car and ran away. So did she not have anything with her? I mean, she or did she gather up all of her stuff before she fled? Like, it doesn't make any sense. Yeah. And he named the wrong driveway where the car was found. There were two semicircle driveways on campus. Right. And he named the one, the other one, not the one that she was actually found in. I mean, you could easily mix them up. But if he's going to remember all of that, exactly, mm-mm, doesn't make any sense. So they go to talk to Arnold again, and he admits that he didn't read the confession before he signed it. He just wanted to get it over with. And they ask him to go over everything that happened again, and he still used the same phrase. He's ninety nine percent sure that he did it. But however, when they said that he wanted, they wanted him to go over everything. Did it say that he? said what happened again like what was in the statement or anything or i mean he basically recounted the same the okay. same story and that he was 99 percent sure but this time he told them things that contradicted the what statement. was in his confession he said that he stepped on a large thermos whenever he was in the back seat and no thermos was found in the car he also said that he locked all the doors But the front one, front passenger was unlocked, and the confession said that he told them Mm -hmm. that he locked those three doors. Yep. But he told his defense lawyers he locked all the doors. And he said that he locked them by pushing down the buttons. But her car didn't have buttons you push down to lock them. Mm -hmm. So that didn't add up either. Mm -mm -mm. Arnold said that he told this to the detectives that took his confession about the thermos, the doors, the buttons, all that. But none of it was in his confession. <laughs> Mind you, he didn't read it. Mm-hmm. Um, judge Grant was the judge who oversaw the hearing, uh, which was basically a preliminary hearing, and he mm-hmm. ruled that there was enough evidence to indict Arnold. Okay. And so there was going to be a trial. Uh, while awaiting trial, Arnold told his defense team that he had gotten a visit from Betty Gale's mother while he was in jail. And that she told him, you did not kill my daughter. Oh my God. There was no verification of this, but they were assured by the people at the jail that if it did happen, it wouldn't happen again. So now Arnold they're thinking... Said that she... Arnold said that she came to jail and said, you did not kill my daughter. Okay. So they're wondering if Betty Gale's mother and or father, both of them, whatever, didn't think that he killed her purely based on the fact that he said she was with another woman. They, they're thinking, you know, just that part of his confession could make them think he didn't do it because that's not true. We know that that's not true. Um, the trial was on October 4th, 1965, so almost three years to the date. Mm-hmm. Um, Betty Gill's parents sat in the front row behind the defendant's table, right behind Arnold and his defense team, which is odd. Yeah, they're... Mm-hmm. Um, The prosecution was seeking the death penalty, and they called the witnesses you'd expect, the detectives, Betty's parents, to testify, you know, about the night leading up to the murder. And they also discussed his past crimes, you know, his disorderly conduct charges, the prostitution Kind of build a character. Yep. So all of that was pretty damning. But witnesses for the defense had some pretty intriguing testimonies of their own. A woman named May Hedges is the friend that Arnold said that he went to her house after and told her that he had killed a woman. Right. She said that Arnold was not at her house that night and that he never mentioned anything about killing anyone. She Did she know him before this? That yes. You know of? Okay. Um, Arnold's aunt testified that Arnold was at her house the night Betty Go Brown was killed. And she knew that she had the date right because her kids had doctor's appointments the next day and her husband, who was sick, had been taken to the hospital the next day. And all of that was confirmed by records. Okay. And 
the most surprising witnesses were Betty Gail Brown's parents. After they had already testified for the prosecution, they testified for the defense. Oh, what are they going to say? So both of them testified that they had a very close relationship with their daughter, and they knew that she had no interest in women. Arnold even took the stand in his own defense, and he stated, quote, I do not at this point in time believe that I killed Betty Gail Brown, but I must admit that I am not 100% sure that I did not kill her. I cannot say with absolute certainty that I did not kill the girl, but I don't think I did. Man. Which, of course, he did. he's not just learning about his, you know, supposed alibi about being at his aunt's. Now he knew about this, you know, before the trial. But after learning that May Hedges denied him being at her house that night, and especially his aunt saying that he was at hers, that's what made him, like, question. Did I even do this? Maybe I didn't do this. His aunt said that, you know, her husband was at a bar with Arnold, her husband was drunk, and Arnold took him home. And Arnold remember all that stuff happening. He just didn't didn't know or didn't think or didn't realize, whatever, that it was that night. But he did remember all that stuff. My goodness. So. I'm thinking maybe in his delusional mind he could see those things happening. Oh, yeah, I'm sure. And think that, okay, I'm remembering. Well, listen to this. God, perfect, this is... <clears throat> perfect segue. Okay. It also came out during the trial that for months after the murder, Arnold had never once thought that he had been involved. He got most of the details from another inmate who knew all about it because this mm-hmm. was an inmate that had been questioned. I mean, like, he passed the polygraph and stuff like that. They, he wasn't involved, but... He was talking to Arnold all about the case and all about the details. And Arnold started dreaming about it while he was in prison. This is when he gets the thought that he may have murdered her. But another big question, is it reasonable to believe that Arnold had no recollection of the murder the next day? He was too drunk to remember it the next day, but he knew all the details three years later? It doesn't make sense. Who was this other inmate that was feeding him all these details i have no idea do you say that he passed a polygraph yeah that inmate wasn't involved he was just questioned i guess okay but he wasn't i guess maybe just down the road if anybody because i thought it was weird that that guy was questioned about it but he was in oregon too this was whenever he was in prison in kentucky for the prostitution ring oh yes okay so, I mean, okay. like I had said earlier, they questioned gotcha. yeah. gobs and gobs of people. I guess I thought that he was still in Oregon. Yeah. Well, he that. hadn't got there yet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I know it's confusing. It is a little bit. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's okay. So, the closing arguments. Um, the book is really good. I'll tell you the name of it at the end because mm-hmm. it gives a little way. But it goes into a lot more detail about the trial and the back and forth. And it's really interesting, but... I just wanted to end the trial part of it with the biggest statements of their closing arguments that, right. like, hits you. The defense's closing argument, the gist of it or whatever, right, said, Alex Arnold has spent most of his adult life hurting himself, not others. He has been a drunk ever since he left the military service after the war and has done a lot of crazy things because of his excessive drinking including forming a belief that he might have killed Betty Gail Brown. I'm actually feeling sorry for this guy. Right? The prosecution, their big statement that stuck out to me, one can only imagine what the last moments of this young woman's life were like, struggling to find some way to escape from her murderer while gasping for breath in a hopeless effort to stay alive. She failed, and that is the only reason we are here today, to hold the defendant responsible for one of the worst killings that I have ever seen. So they're just playing on, uh, what's the word that I'm thinking of? Not guilt, not sorrow. Sympathy? Yes, thank you. <laughs> Golly. I know that word. I mean, that. <sighs> so the jury goes to deliberate, and they deliberate for more than six hours. I'm assuming that they put in there the confession and all that, that it wasn't even written by him. Yeah, the... Everything that you've mentioned to me, that I've, they... Yeah, I mentioned came them. up during Good. the trial at some point. Good. Um, I didn't want to be too redundant. No, that's completely fine. So, the jury comes back, 
more than six hours later, and they're deadlocked. Five voted for conviction, and seven voted for acquittal. So the judge declared a mistrial, and they scheduled a retrial for January of the next year in 1966. The Browns, after the trial, made a public statement that indicated that they would continue to search for the truth about the murder of their daughter. That right there to me seems like they don't think Arnold was guilty. If they were still wanting to, you know, know the truth, then they don't feel like they have the truth already, obviously. Right. They're not saying we're still seeking justice. They're saying we're still seeking the truth. Or to me... If they were going to make a statement after that, it would be along the lines of that we want him held accountable. You know, we want him, you know, like you said, seeking justice or something, not that we want to know what happened. Exactly. So Arnold was released on bail, and the retrial kept getting pushed. It was pushed to this, it was pushed to this, pushed to this, later and later and later. And there was never any more information released, no more evidence came forward. And the retrial never happened. The prosecution, they never got anything else, anything to add to it, so they didn't think that so did they it was going to go any different. So they not retrial at all because there was nothing new? I'm assuming that's the main reason Okay. why they didn't. I mean, they didn't have any more evidence. It didn't work the first time with what they had, so. Arnold died in a VA hospital in Lexington in 1980. From liver disease, because he was an alcoholic, unfortunately, and he died at the age of 49. Man. Probably never knowing for sure if he killed her or not. That's awful. Which is awful. Um, What's interesting, though, in 1988, so more than 25 years after the murder, one of the prosecutors on Arnold's case, he revealed what his theory is. Okay. He thinks that Arnold intended, intended to sexually assault Betty Gale and murdered her when she resisted okay and that's it what there's no new leads no more information arnold is dead there wasn't a retrial so there's plenty of people that think he did it i don't and got away with it there's plenty of people that think that he didn't do it and the real murderer got away with it so the question is who who killed killed betty Betty gale brown And the book that I read by Robert G. Lawson is called Who Killed Betty Gale Brown? Murder, Mistrial, and Mystery. Couldn't tell you the name earlier because you would know there was a mistrial. Yeah. Man, I didn't know it was unsolved. I think it's unsolved. Of course, obviously, if anything else ever comes up, we'll do an update. But after all this time, there's still nothing. Yeah, I mean, how many years later? This is in 60? 62. 80 years? No. 40. No. No. 60. 60 years. You can cut that out. We can't math. Okay. <laughs> Anybody who's listening to this that Pencil. knows me already knows that I can't math, so... <laughs> my my um, top of the head math skills are quite low, so they're impaired. It's okay. <laughs> we figure it out in the end. That's all that matters. Man. So yeah, that is, that is it. That is our first episode. I hope everybody was intrigued. And found it interesting. I don't think he did it. I don't think he did it. At all. There's too much that he said that was left out of the confession. Right. There's I mean, too much that there he was said nothing... that didn't line up with the facts, facts, the hard facts. Right, of the case. and everything in the confession was already said. Exactly. I don't like this. <laughs> Sorry. Who done it? We may never know. Um, we do have an email. Anybody who has any personal stories, spooky stories, paranormal stories, true crime stories, you can email us at relativelydarkpodcast at gmail.com. And we also have an Instagram where we'll post pictures. And if you have any cases that you want us to cover, send those in. Anything that is suggested, we'll definitely consider. I think anything that we we end up discussing do discussing we'll make sure to give a shout out exactly yeah unless you specifically say you don't want us to right yeah thanks for listening (laughs) we hope you you keep listening yes bye 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 goodbye